do some of my best thinking when I'm just laying back, relaxing. So, here I am reading some of my comments uh, from a subscriber named Troll True. Very, very ironic name, Troll True. The troll part, you know, is commonly an uh, insult to those who would speak unfavorably about another on YouTube. But this guy's really creative. And he, get, he gets the juices flowing up here and, and makes me think outside the box all the time. I really appreciate it. And I thought I'd share some updates on the port airflow and that theory video is great but I really only just tapped the surface of what I've been studying and learning about so here goes car problems got your head in the sand be triumphant you have a champion to help you. Huzzah! Welcome to the D.E. Nichols channel. Autobotter.com He says, come now. Efficiency and power, like you said, do go hand in hand. More fuel make more power. He goes on to make a, a point about a hemispherical head uh, by Dodge that makes similar power, but only with six and a half to one air fuel ratio he's like okay is it really that much more powerful if it has to use so much fuel so he takes that uh, metaphor talking about mine so on these heads I don't know for sure how worth it is the mod might be if there's a trade-off opening up the ports will lose you some low-end response from the reduced torque at low engine speeds well what would camshaft timing and duration do for the engine with this head design? And the answer to that is, without some kind of fancy additional ECU, I don't think it would understand that the engine would be set up to know that it can run probably a little more timing advance. Because when you open up and reshape combustion chambers and everything else like that, it actually drops your compression a bit. So you can actually push it farther without having knock exactly what I was thinking next he says the same thing right but if this is all helpful to efficiency then its drawbacks could be redeemed as in you'd maintain stock engine torque at that given engine speed when changing the port volumes what I said could be nonsense for all I know it's actually quite good when he continues only time will tell if I could, I see more of this and what combination of other modifications people have done alongside this design in the meantime, I'll see what I can experiment with in creating a vortex in the airstream with the intake tract before it reaches cylinder heads, cyclone or twister shaped pieces that spin air as it passes it. I've actually learned a lot about this in elementary school. I had my buddy get into this, and it, it turns out that when you have two turbines spinning in opposite directions, the uh, what it does with that air is it it almost like makes a, a tornado uh, like it's vacuumed towards the center and then it comes out the other side it's I might have it totally wrong I'm mean, reaching back to elementary school to a creative inventor buddy of mine I decided to be an inventor when I grew up based upon my relationship with him and all the things we thought about we make all kinds of little designs of things Ryan he, he, he was a good friend said I have that said, I have tried the those hokey tornado things. I'm, I have no doubt that they probably work on something, but seeing how air gets into my engine, there is no way an in intake tube having something that it creates a twisting airflow is going to actually get more past that throttle plate. I tried it; it didn't work. In fact, sometime in the future, I looked in the intake tube again, and it, it wasn't even there anymore. So mystery on me how that disappeared probably because for a time my original intake boot would sometimes separate a bit probably had the opportunity to eventually fall out I don't know but all I know is that wouldn't be the way if you could do that inside the intake ports or actually inside the intake have little tiny mini tornadoes uh, four of them 
to help twist the air into there. You know, I'm sure it's been tried. I'd rather get four larger intake valves and do the quad design by David Vizard. Uh, it's it's tried and proved, and while everything is an experiment, it has, it has never done done by me before. Going with something tried and true in my design now is probably a better choice in this case. Though we're this is still we're after a swirl, okay? And I responded with a few positive, encouraging comments about what he said. And then I replied like I did to everyone else who left a comment in my last port and airflow theory about a new article I wrote. In reaction to the Eastwood Company producing a very good video on basic porting. Uh, they didn't do anything aggressive, they did everything in a very gentle way, which is much safer on the DIY side, especially if you don't have a way to prove your additional airflow results without usually very expensive machinery. That, that can be very difficult to truly know the flow has increased and you haven't made things worse. More to your point, I'm certain I'll not lose top end power if all I do is porting. As it sits, my engine already runs 14.7 to 1 at watt. This car is supposed to go rich, but it can't because I've already maxed it out with a bigger catalytic converter, open magnet flow muffler, larger cat box exhaust, not to mention the short ram air intake, which really increased the airflow like double. Yeah, my math is showing a lot more airflow. And I, I'm sure it's not just off because the fuel trims didn't go nuts when I switched it out. I had to prove it to a three-year diagnostician even. When we were trying to figure out what was wrong with my car, my air control valve doesn't quite have the correct duty cycle response inside of it. It's given the signal and PCM keeps giving more and more signal until the IAC responds. And IAC's just, it's, I bought a bad brand new part from Japan. Enough about that point is, the short arm air intake is a win. I've watched a lot of live data. I apologize, I don't have a very good way of recording it to prove it to you, but it's definitely a win with my car. It's not causing any drivability issues. And to get more to the point, it'd be more ridiculous if I managed to get tuned exhaust headers for it. My point is, the fuel system has to be upgraded if it's going to keep up. I've looked into ideas where you can store extra fuel that fuel pump doesn't have to keep up when demand is particularly high. The device is $600, monkey wrench racing. Wow. Yeah, right. It's a few simple idea on the surface. I think finding a higher flowing pump somehow still has similar flow at normal loads. I don't know if such a thing exists, but at the same time, I know it's possible. Just like an alternator knows when load is increased, it sees the voltage from its stator versus the B plus wire, which goes the battery, I think an electronic circuit like that could command more power to the fuel pump. You see, when the windings are given more electricity, it makes the magnet stronger in the alternator, so it's literally using energy to make even more energy. Thanks, I got a, a refresher from that on that from Susan52. I'm seeing I need a voltage regulator for my fuel pump. Wow. Uh, the way you'll just pull ideas from anywhere makes me my creativity boost just to think uh, of talking to you. Thank you. I'm talking to Troll True again. One catch. Some fuel pumps increase flow by changing the hertz. Meaning it's a duty cycle rather than more voltage. So I have to know more about the design of the Toyota pump first. And then I got thinking about some other things, other mods, other people have done to my generation of Toyota Corolla. And I realized there was an easier way to figure out how to get the more fuel. Because like I said, at Watt, I already can't get any more power because I've increased airflow, increased airflow, increased airflow, and power is barely moving because I'm still having a lie stoichiometric at Watt. As I'm coming up on the RPMs, uh, 3,000, 4,000, you know, it can it can go rich, but when it's more like 4,000 to 5,000, the engine starts doing, well, we're just going to run stoichiometric because I'm getting so much air that I can't go what. So I'll just maintain what I can do. That said, I think that's why 
my car is particularly brilliant. When I really step on it, I, I really don't waste gas. It's insane. But I really don't because I'm not running rich. I'm getting that really efficient, <laughs> really efficient speed out of it. It's, it's incredible. Okay, on Toyota Nation, I know I've seen at some point people uh, putting superchargers on their 8th generation Corolla. A supercharger is actually made for the ninth generation Corolla. They're very rare. They're difficult to get. They're not made anymore. And if you can get one, it's probably already broken. I don't know. So the idea there doesn't seem very good. But since I'm going after more airflow by uh, if increasing the volumetric efficiency inside the engine, that means I can still go after more fuel without the supercharger to get some of the effect. Uh, if I go to those that supercharger group and find out how they got more fuel, what injector, can the fuel pump actually keep up? Is the fuel injector actually the uh, the problem where it's the bottleneck on the flow? I don't know. Uh, but if you, I can find out how they got things to work out without fuel trims going nuts so the car is still very drivable, um, then I'll have a way to go to make all of this work together just beautifully primary effect of reworking the ports is to get straighter or more laminar flow. Whenever you have a turn over the short, the short bend, right where it turns like 90 degrees to be able to go into the engine, that's a moment where that hump can be reduced on the side. Let me think about it, what angle. That would be the floor. Yeah, that would be the floor of the port. Uh, the the one that the, the side that is closest on the turn if you dig into that more you're making that f it's kind of like a car trying to do a 65 mile an hour turn instead of a 55 mile an hour turn by taking material out there more of the the flow will not have to slow down as it makes its turn so that's a time that it's particularly effective that yeah, technically you've reduced your port volume and therefore you may have reduced velocity, but since it's not having to go over the resistance for the short turn, you're actually in a better circumstance. Um, he's also worrying about the trade-offs, and I think the trade-offs don't have to be as bad. Uh, digging by hand, by hand behind the valves, where there's a ridge, for example, is actually a velocity inhibitor, and that zone. when the air hits it, it tends to make it tumble and at this point with fuel injection versus carburetor you really don't need any more tumbling. All that does is get the fuel droplets to hit each other more and when they hit each other more there's richer thicker pockets that don't burn as easily so you're not going to get as good of a burn. Then right after that there's a machinist ridge. Um, I'll be sure to add a link to below so you can see an image of that or my new fancy video editor, or maybe I can work it in there as well. But there's the machinist ridge. Um, you got your four valves, okay? And they have this thick ridge of metal around them that is blocking the flow. There's a technique where you put old valves or new valves you don't care about in there to protect it, and you carve a trench around each of them, and then you blend it without getting into the quench area of the combustion. I've got pictures to aid in all of this um, in understanding that. This might be re going over some of the same ground, mm -hmm. but what I was thinking about was techniques that are streetable. Okay? Machinist ridge, I would rate that as getting rid of that as uh, streetable because it creates less turbulent air. I think it would be an improvement on a good engine for any circumstance. Another streetable technique would be 80 grit finish. That mirror finish stuff, it might be fascinating, it might get a lot of hits on YouTube. It's beautiful. And it might, and it, forgive me, I'm going to backstab my own thinking on this a bit, but if it's really clean like that, I would think it pick less carbon up. It might maintain it in a good state better longer okay 
but the point of an aigrette finish is that it creates uh, you know like a, a layer of grit in the middle in the metal it's it's not truly smooth those tiny vertices they're not hurting airflow you need that little cushion of little vertices of air creating roller bearings so that all the other air can go past faster this this is something that's been proven okay so that's streetable everything is simply cast aluminum on my engine cast aluminum cast iron doesn't matter the thing is is it's going to have that modeled textured surface and it doesn't need to be it you can get that to an 80 grit finish and get those vertices working for you instead of against you because the iron cast has much bigger turbulences that are much less stable and create more problems okay remember get out there and work on something or you might get whiny like he's been because he wasn't on camera